But here in the Majestic Simpkin School of Human Rights, we are just getting into the swing of things. Of course, yesterday we were welcome, we were able to welcome Dr. Eric Gelman of UNC Chapel Hill to talk a bit more about the Southern Negro Youth Congress. Uh, I would highly encourage all of you, if you've not had a chance to join us last night, to view that recording as soon as you can. Uh, it was very enlightening and informative, and I will reference some of what he talked about yesterday in today's class. And we are also fortunate and privileged to welcome Dr. Christian Anderson of the University of South Carolina to join us this evening to talk a bit more about the long and vexing history of desegregation in higher education here in the Palmetto State. As we all know, that history is very boring and straightforward, and there's nothing of importance to learn <laughs> from that board here and now. On the contrary, as we all know, the Majestic Simpkins School is all about tying the past to the present. And I think today's lecture is going to, to do a lot of that. So let's go ahead and get this show on the road. <clears throat> Now, as Dr. Gelman mentioned last night, and I absolutely agree with him on this, uh, the time period right after World War II is one of those periods in history that I think best summarizes what a lot of historians like to say whenever asked a serious question about what they do, which is to say it's complicated. And certainly the post-World War II years were a very complicated period in both American and world history. What made them especially complicated, of course, was the role South Carolina had to play in this history as well. And we're gonna talk a great deal about that this evening. Now you notice I, I have the title of today's lecture as South Carolina and the Human Rights Struggle, 1945 to 1954. Uh, when I was growing up and going to school and learning about American history, uh, this is one of those parts in the class where our, my teacher would kind of fast forward from things. Uh, one day we're doing the end of World War II, the next day is Brown v. Board of Education, and suddenly the Civil Rights Movement begins, and we all know that traditional story. Um, it wasn't really until I got to college and especially graduate school where I began to learn how complicated this period after World War II and going into the 1950s actually was. And I hope that this evening's class really gets this across as well. Certainly our study guide for this week also covered a great deal of this information, more so talking about desegregation, but I wanna give you guys some context for what we're talking about both in the study guide and for Dr. Anderson's remarks this evening too. Now I actually wanna start our story in Charleston in 1945. And this actually harkens back to what Dr. Carrie Taylor mentioned a couple of weeks ago about Charleston's long history of labor and social and human activism. In 1945, there was a strike at Charleston's cigar factory um, where both black and white women went on strike demanding concessions on wages and working conditions. Um, and this strike lasted from October of 1945 until March of 1946. So just a month after World War II officially ended, going to the following year. Now, this particular strike um, is really part of a much longer tradition of activism in Charleston. Um, as Dr. Taylor mentioned last week, he talked about the history of the longshoremen in Charleston, um, strikes in the 1930s. And this 1945 strike in particular is important to keep in mind when we talk about and discuss the 1969 Charleston Hospital Worker Strike that is perhaps the best known uh, moment of labor activism in Charleston's long and important history of activism. Now, one of the things that also came out of the strike was the song, A We Shall Overcome, uh, which was actually originally sung by striking workers in Charleston to symbolize the end of picketing for that particular day. At the time, the song was known as We Will Overcome, uh, but eventually the lyrics were changed a bit and became We Shall Overcome, thanks to members of the Highland of Folk School out of Tennessee who were actually down in Charleston to help out and give advice on the strike. So again, one of the key themes of the Majestic Simpkins School 
is not just talking about the fact that there were actually activists and activism in South Carolina, but making it very clear that this activism had a major impact on activists in America and all over the globe. Again, just taking this song, We Shall Overcome, as an example, We Shall Overcome was sung not just by civil rights demonstrators in the 1950s and 60s, it'd be sung by solidarity activists in Poland, by South Korean human rights activists in the late 1980s, and it is still sung today all over the world, a symbol of resistance to oppression and tyranny. Again, all of that came out of Charleston, South Carolina. Now, of course, since this is a history course on South Carolina, we have to cover the good, the bad, and the ugly of the Palmetto State. Uh, James Burns, sometimes the bad, sometimes the ugly, usually a combination of the two. Now, we've already talked a little bit about Burns. Um, in case you don't remember, uh, James Burns was at one point a congressman from South Carolina. Uh, he was a key ally of President Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, he would serve on the Supreme Court for a brief period of time, and then he would leave the Supreme Court and become basically one of the key figures in America's uh, World War II wartime production. In fact, you can make an argument that he was the second most powerful man in the country after President Roosevelt himself during the war years. <laughs> Now, after the Second World War, uh, Burns would remain very important. He would become Secretary of State under President Harry Truman, and he helped set Cold War era policy against the Soviet Union and their allies around the world. Now, the thing about Secretary of State Burns was that we now know he was also an instrumental figure in the utilization of the atom bomb in 1945. Uh, he was one of those members of the federal government who made a persuasive argument for using the bomb, not just to bring Japan to the negotiation table to end World War II, but more importantly, in Burns' estimation, to show that to the Soviet Union that the United States had a weapon of awesome destructive power. Um, Burns was one of the leading advocates for the use of the atom bomb. And in case you don't know, when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August 1945, there was far from a consensus within the federal government over using the bomb. Uh, some figures like General Dwight D. Eisenhower were not so sure about using it, this weapon, but others like Secretary of State Burns was very much in favor of dropping the atom bomb and his viewpoint eventually went out. Now, the thing about Burns is that he is going to be also very important in terms of talking about domestic policy in just a second. But I want to first mention Burns tonight in terms of how important he is to American foreign policy. Once again, leaders from South Carolina have proven time and time again to be important on issues of American foreign policy, whether it's John C. Calhoun, the 19th century, James Burns here, or later on figures like Strom Thurmond, or today, Lindsey Grant. Of course, if you want to learn much more about James Burns, you're welcome to read some of Becky Robbins' work on SC history, including Generation No, and also her booklet on Majestic Simpkins, which goes in much further detail and depth with some of these key time periods. And by the way, in case you don't recognize this, this is actually James Burns being awarded uh, Man of the Year by Time Magazine in 1947. So this shows you just how powerful and how important Burns was during the early Cold War years. But the world of Harry Truman and James Burns was also the world of Isaac Woodard and Orson Welles. Now, right after World War II came to an end in 1945 and 1946 and going into 1947, you see a spate of violence targeting Black veterans coming home from the war. It's actually quite similar to the Red Summer of 1919, except in this case, uh, the murders targeting Black veterans were all over the South. Uh, there were Black veterans being killed in Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee. Some of them were being killed while still in uniform. Others were being killed because they had the temerity to actually speak out 
on issues of simple human dignity. But perhaps the greatest symbol of what Black veterans and their families were facing in the post-war years became a man who wasn't killed, but was blinded for life. And that, of course, is Isaac Woodard, who you see here in this photograph being led up the stairs. Uh, to his right is, of course, boxing legend Joe Lewis. Now, Woodard, like many other Black veterans who mustered out of the service in 1945, uh, received his uh, back pay for service in the armed forces, on his way home from Augusta, Georgia, and was traveling from South Carolina to meet his family in North Carolina. However, uh, Woodard, who again had served in the Pacific Theater, had seen considerable combat throughout the Pacific Ocean in World War II, asked the driver they could pull over so they could use the restroom. The driver angrily refused, and Woodard cussed the driver back. Again, this is a man who had seen combat. To him, Asking for a bathroom break seemed like something that was out, not, not out of the ordinary. Eventually, the bus would stop near Aiken, South Carolina, and there the bus driver would tell local authorities that Isaac Woodard was essentially up at him, that he had spoken out of turn, that he needed to be taught what his place actually was in the South. Woodard did not physically resist arrest. Woodard, in fact, felt he did nothing wrong, and it was quite clear he had done nothing wrong. But for his troubles, Woodard was arrested by the police and was eventually beaten, beaten so badly that his eyes were actually gouged out. He was blinded for the rest of his life. By the way, in case you're curious, Woodard did not pass away until 1991. So this is someone who was alive during my lifetime. Now, Woodard's story normally would have simply ended there. It would have been simply another Black man attacked by the police for no good reason whatsoever, a story which unfortunately is almost as old as the country itself. But this was different. For one thing, Woodard was a veteran. Number two, his case was quickly talked about by the NAACP, and number three, Celebrities and activists across the United States made common cause with the saga of Isaac Woodard. Uh, Woody Guthrie, for example, uh, wrote a ballad about Isaac Woodard and the problems he faced. Um, and Orson Welles, uh, the actor you see on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, used his weekly radio program to talk about Woodard's case several times. Now, what I want to do now is actually play a few minutes of Orson Welles' radio program from 1946. And I want you to put yourselves in the position of someone listening to this program in 1946. This is really important to context. Orson Welles, again, a man who was already one of the most famous men in the world at that time. He had made Citizen Kane. He had scared folks of War of the Worlds on the radio broadcast, etc. Orson Welles, using his radio program to talk about the saga of Isaac Woodard, it, it's hard to imagine an equivalent. It'd be like, I, I guess, I don't know, Beyonce having a TikTok about Palestine. I'm not sure. But it, it'd be that equivalent where Orson Welles was that famous worldwide. <laughs> but what he asked his audience to do was something that was extraordinary in 1946 and I would argue extraordinary in 2024. He asked his mostly white audience to imagine what it was like to be Black in America. Let's take a brief listen to this. And again, I, I think this program is really important to getting across how conversations or debates about racism in the 1940s were beginning to take some dramatic and interesting turns. So let me go ahead and share my sound, share my screen, and make it also on Good morning, this is Orson Welles speaking. I'd like to read you an affidavit 
I, Isaac Woodward Jr., being duly sworn to depose and state as follows, that I am 27 years old and a veteran of the United States Army, having served for 15 months in the South Pacific and earned one battle star. I was honorably discharged on February 12, 1946, from Camp Gordon, Georgia, at 8.30 p.m. at the Greyhound Terminal, Atlanta, Georgia. While I was in uniform, I purchased a ticket to Winsboro, South Carolina, and took the bus headed there to pick up my wife to come to New York to see my father and mother. About one hour out of Atlanta, the bus driver stopped at a small drugstore. As he stopped, I asked him if he had time to wait for me until I had a chance to go to the restroom. He cursed and said no. When he cursed me, I cursed him back. When the bus got to Aiken, he got off and went and got the police. They didn't give me a chance to explain. The policeman struck me with a billy across my head and told me to shut up. After that, the policeman grabbed me by my left arm and twisted it behind my back. I figured he was trying to make me resist. I did not resist against him. He asked me, was I discharged? And I told him... Yes, when I said yes, that is when he started beating me with a billy, hitting me across the top of the head. After that, I grabbed his billy and wrung it out of his hand. Another policeman came up and threw his gun on me and told me to drop the billy, and he dropped me, so I dropped the billy. After I dropped the billy, the second policeman held his gun on me while the other one was beating me. He knocked me unconscious. After I commenced to come to myself, he all would get up. I started to get up. He started punching me in my eyes with the end of the billy. When I finally got up, he pushed me inside the jailhouse and locked me up. I woke up next morning and could not see. A policeman said, let's go up here and see what the judge says. I told him that I could not see how to come out. I was blind. He said, feel your way out. He said, I'd be all right after I washed my face. He led me to the judge, and after I told the judge what happened, he said, we don't have that kind of stuff down here. Then the policeman said, he wrung my billy out of my hand, I told him if he didn't drop it, I'd drop him. That's how I knew it was the same policeman as had beat my eyes out. After that, the judge spoke and said, I fine you $50 or 30 days in the road. And I said, I'd pay the $50, but I did not have the $50 at the time. So the policeman said, you have some money there in your wallet. He took my wallet and took out all I had. That was a total of $40 and took $4 from my watch pocket. I had a check for $694.73, which was my mustering out pay and soldier's deposit. He said to me, can you see how to sign this check? You have a government check. I told him, no, sir. So he gave it back to me after that. Took me back and locked me up in the jail. The policeman did, and I stayed in there for a while. And after a few minutes, he came and asked me if I wanted a drink of whiskey. I, if I took a drink of whiskey, he said I'd feel better. I told him, no, sir. Didn't care for any. About 5.30 that evening, they took me to the Veterans Hospital in Columbia, South Carolina. One of the contact men came around one day and said to me they were going to take out a pension for me. I believe that the doctor who cared for me was named Dr. Clarence. I told him what had happened to me. He made no comment, but told me I should join a blind school sworn to me this 23rd day of April 1946 well ladies and gentlemen I had that affidavit in my pocket a few hours before dawn when I left off worrying about this broadcast long enough for coffee at an all night restaurant I found myself joined at the table by a stranger a nice soft spoken well meaning well mannered stranger he was he told me a joke he thinks it's a joke I'm going to repeat it but not for your amusement I earnestly hope that nobody listening will laugh this is the joke. It seems there was a white man who came on business to a southern town. It could be Aiken, South Carolina, and found he couldn't get a bed in any of the good hotels. He went to the bad hotels and found the flop houses, but there was no room for him in any of the inns reserved for white hope folks in that southern city. So at last, in desperation, he applied at a Negro hotel where he was accepted with the proviso that he would consent to share a double room with another guest. With rueful gratitude, this white man paid his bill, left a call for early in the morning. He rested well, quite undisturbed by the proximity of the sleeping colored man beside him and was awakened at the hour of his request. After breakfast, he left the railway station where he boarded his appointed train, but the conductor would not let him into any of the regular coaches. The man was told quite rudely to go where he belonged, the Jim Crow car. The hero of this funny story allowed he hadn't washed in the morning that the dust of travel must be responsible for the conductor's grievous social miscalculation. He went to the washroom. He started to clean his hands. They were black, an even hue of black. Then he looked into the mirror. His face was the same color. He not only looked darker than white, he was quite visibly a Negro. A great oath precedes the final line, which is presumed to be the funny part of this little anecdote. I know what's happened to the next words of the man. It's very simple. They woke up the wrong man. I left the teller of this tale in the coffee shop, but I found I couldn't leave the tale itself. Like the affidavit I read to you at the start of the broadcast, it seems to become a permanent part of my mental luggage. I sketched in my imagination a sequel to the stranger's funny joke. I saw the man of business 
We'd gone to bed, a white man getting into an argument with the conductor. I saw a policeman boarding the train at the next station and taking the man of business out on the platform and beating the eyes out of his head because the man thought he should be treated with the same respect he had received the day before when he was white. I saw men at the police station trying to make him take a drink so that the medical authorities could testify that he was drunk. I saw the man of business bleeding in his cell, reaching out with sightless hands through unseen bars, gesturing for help that would not, could not ever come. And I heard his explanation echoing down the stone hallways of the jail. I know what's happened. It's very simple. They woke up the wrong man. You know what's happened? Very simple. They woke up the wrong man. And again, what you're seeing here with with how Orson Welles is talking about the saga of Isaac Woodard is that he's not just talking about how horrible it certainly was, but he's asking his audience to actually think about what it would have been like to have experienced this. He's asking his audience, again, a mostly white audience, to imagine just for a brief moment what it was like to be Black in America in 1946. And as you could tell from his answer there, he suspected most white Americans would not like what they would have experienced. Now, the case of Isaac Woodard is just one of many examples of not just the kind of oppression and violence that Black veterans face after World War II, but it's also indicative of why so many Black Americans are returning home with a newfound sense of radicalism, which takes many, many different forms. Now, in South Carolina, what you're seeing, thanks to leaders like Majeska Simpkins, is an activism that is being tied to the Southern Negro Youth Congress. Um, as Dr. Gelman mentioned to us last night, uh, he argued that the reason that the conference is held in Columbia in 1946 is that, quite simply, the Palmetto State is suddenly becoming a central battleground in the fight, not just for civil rights at home, but in the fight for human rights all over the world. Now, this particular conference was held at the Township Auditorium downtown. And not only were South Carolinians there, but folks from across the country and around the world were coming in to talk about this post-World War II era, not just an era that they saw filled with oppression, and violence, and the last vestiges of fascism, but for many of the activists there, including folks as young as Esther Cooper Jackson, who was in her 20s, to W.E.B. Du Bois, who was, I think at this point, entering his 70s, there was also a sense of optimism that with the destruction of Nazism, the defeat of imperialism around the world, with the victory of the Allies in World War II, there was a sense that human beings had within their grasp the ability to change the world for the better. The colonization movements were on the march in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Throughout Europe and the United States, there were fights for civil and human rights as well. And during the Southern Negro Youth Congress conference in 1946 in Columbia, held in October of that year, luminaries such as W.E.B. Du Bois and Paul Robeson made it very clear they were determined to see this fight through to the bitter end. During this conference, Dr. Du Bois gave perhaps the greatest speech of his career titled Behold the Land. And usually during the class, I'll read an excerpt from uh, his speech and I want to do so right now, but I'm gonna use an excerpt that's closer to the end of his address. And I, I'm gonna show, once again, share my screen here just so you can see what I'm talking about here. But the Boas' speech that he gives in 1946 is one where he is not only telling activists about the importance of what they're doing, but he's making it very clear that this fight for freedom has to include the American South. There's no simple way of saying, oh, we can just leave behind South Carolina or Georgia or Alabama. We can run away from our problems. No, he's saying that these problems are global problems. 
But the solution to those problems, the solution to civil rights problems at home and human rights problems all over the world was to be found in what he called the firing line of South Carolina. And so this is near uh, the end of his speech where Du Bois, again, speaking to a crowd of both South Carolinians and folks from all across the globe, people who were teenagers, who were college students, who were much older, men and women who were involved in movements of liberalism and progressivism and social democracy and communism. He tells them all the following. To rescue this land in this way calls for the great sacrifice. This is the thing that you are called upon to do because it is the right thing to do. Because you are embarked upon a great and holy crusade, the emancipation of mankind, black and white, the upbuilding of democracy, the breaking down, particularly here in the South, of forces of evil represented by race prejudice in South Carolina, by lynching in Georgia, by disenfranchisement in Mississippi, by ignorance in Louisiana, and by all these the monopoly of wealth in the whole South. There could be no more splendid vocation beckoning to the youth of the 20th century after the flat failures of white civilization, after the flamboyant establishment of an industrial system which creates poverty and the children of poverty, which are ignorance and disease and crime, after the crazy boasting of a white culture that finally ended in wars which ruined civilization in the whole world, in the midst of allied peoples who have yelled about democracy and never practiced it, either in the British Empire or in the American Commonwealth or in South Carolina. Here is the chance for young women and young men of devotion to lift again the banner of humanity and to walk toward a civilization which will be free and intelligent, which will be healthy and unafraid, and build in the world a culture led by Black folk and joined by peoples of all colors and all races without poverty, ignorance, and disease. That was W. B. Du Bois, October 1946, Township Auditorium right here in Columbia, South Carolina. And really, when I read words like this, when I read a speech like this, I, I can't help but think about the kind of imagination behind a speech like this, where Du Bois is saying, we can defeat poverty, we can defeat ignorance, we can defeat disease and devastation and desolation in our societies. We can actually do all these things and more. This isn't, this wasn't high in the sky rhetoric. This was Dr. Du Bois saying, we are coming back from the brink of annihilation. And now is our opportunity to make things right for everyone, black, white, and every race, creed, and color in between. So not just folks in America, but for folks all over the world. And this is really a speech that could be given right now. It could be given right now at this very moment, again in the township on April 29th, 2024. And the words would still ring true, perhaps in some cases even truer than they did in 1946. But this is the kind of rhetoric, the kind of imagination, the kind of belief in positive social change that was in the air in the post-World War II years. Again, we tend to make the jump as historians right from World War II to the Cold War. That we went right from fighting the Nazis and the Japanese and the Italians to now we're in a Cold War against the Soviet Union. But there was a brief moment in history, very brief, too brief perhaps, where there was a real sense in the air that perhaps peace or at least something different could have been achieved. And again, this is all part of the larger mission that all these individuals were getting involved in. All these organizations were also getting involved in. The problem, though, was that violence throughout the South was still an ongoing issue. Um, in South Carolina, of course, we already had the blighting of Isaac Woodard in 1947, but also the lynching of Willie Earl, where in 1947, 
Earl was accused of uh, murdering a cab driver. Uh, very, very flimsy, really no evidence whatsoever. Um, Earl was lynched. Um, and usually this is where the story ends, except for one very important difference. The state of South Carolina, embarrassed by this latest lynching, and this is also considered the last lynching in the state's history, decided to actually investigate the lynching. The investigation was led by Strom Thurmond, who at the time was serving as governor of South Carolina. Now, Governor Thurmond made it very clear to his constituents in South Carolina that an investigation was important to prove to the nation and the world that lynch, uh, lynch rule and lynch mob was a thing of the past. Now, the state government would launch this investigation. They would actually have a trial in, in place as well. And they actually found men who admitted to being part of the mob that killed Willie Earl. They literally admitted to being in the mob and helping to kill Willie Earl, which meant, of course, that no one actually went to jail for the crime. Because, again, it was a trial by jury, and a jury of their peers decided, eh, no, they did it, and we don't care. This, in fact, would lead to um, the federal government taking lynching even more seriously in the post-World War II years because they began to understand the NAACP's argument for a federal anti-lynching bill. Uh, because, again, the NAACP's whole argument was the problem with having local and state juries handling lynch cases is that a trial by jury, a trial of your peers, wasn't really a true trial of your peers. It was going to be a trial by men and women who were more than likely either allied to the lynch mob or allied to the cause that the lynch mob mm -hmm. represented. Uh, still, Governor Thurman argued that this was a victory for law and order in the South, and it showed that South Carolina was actually moving in a forward-thinking and progressive direction. But by 1948, Thurman would be well known across the country for a very, very different release. Now, stop me if you've heard this before. We have an embattled Democratic president who is faced with the myriad of crises both at home and abroad. Some of those crises include tensions with Russia, problems in the Middle East, at home, the economy is not doing very well. Race relations are not so great. And overall, there is a general sense among the American people that a different direction is desperately needed. Of course, I'm talking about Harry Truman. Who did you think I was talking about? And in 1948, President Truman was in stuck between a rock and a hard place. Um, his advisors were telling him that he really only had one chance to win re-election to the White House in 1948. And again, this is after, this is three years after the end of World War II. Uh, the economy, trying to adjust to a peacetime economy, is not doing so great. Uh, there was labor activism all across the country in 1946, 47, and 48. Uh, there is a sense globally speaking, that there is an oncoming Cold War with the Soviet Union, and there is a general sense of unease amongst the American people. But Truman's advisors tell him he does have one potential ace up his sleeve. Civil rights. They tell President Truman, if you come out aggressively in favor of civil rights, Black voters in states like New York, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, will come out in droves to support your campaign. Now, despite the fact that Black voters had begun to support the New Deal Democratic Party coalition in the 1930s and 40s, the Black vote was by no means uh, certain for the Democratic Party in 1948. In fact, there were some rumblings that there was dissatisfaction with President Truman for his lack of action on civil rights. And so Truman very quickly moved to desegregate the armed forces, he becomes the first president in history to visit the NAACP's annual meeting. Um, he supports the release of a book called The Secure These Rights, which was released in 1948 to show how the federal government was trying to take race relations more seriously. And at the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia in 1948, liberal Democrats, most notably a young mayor out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, named Hubert Humphrey, 
lead the charge to push the Democratic Party to be more forcefully in favor of civil rights. As then Mayor, later Senator Humphrey put it, it was time for the party to move out of the shadow of states' rights into the sunshine of human rights. Upon hearing this from Mayor Humphrey, many Southern Democrats walked out of the Democratic National Convention in mass and reconvened in Alabama to form the States' Rights or Dixiecrat Party. Their nominee for president was, of course, our good friend, Strom Thurmond, who ran on a platform of segregation. And their hope was not to win the presidency. They knew they weren't going to win the presidency. Their hope was to win enough electoral college votes in the South to force the election that year to the House, where they hoped to receive concessions from both major parties to prevent any further civil rights legislation. And again, here's um, a poster of the states' rights Dixie Pratt Party, Get in the Fight for States' Rights, led by Governor Thurman of South Carolina, and Governor Fielding uh, L. Wright of Mississippi. And I can't help but notice in the middle the Statue of Liberty with the giant states' rights shield. Mm -hmm. Very, very nice touch there. But 1948 wasn't just about the Dixiecrats and the Democrats and the Republicans. There was also a fourth party that was getting involved in the fray. We kind of you kind of forget about them, but they're important in the story too, because again, this party, the Progressive Party, was filled with men and women who imagined an alternative to not just states' rights, but an alternative to the way things were in America, an alternative to the status quo in a much more leftward direction. Now, Henry Wallace, the man you see on the left hand side of the screen, uh, was at one point Franklin Roosevelt's vice president. Um, he also served as a very successful Secretary of Agriculture, but after 1944, when he was dropped from the ticket in favor of Harry Truman, Wallace was seen as being too left-wing for the Democratic Party. Now, in 1940, to go back for a second, Wallace had written an essay about the age of the common man, where he made an argument that in the post-World War II years, and again, he's writing this during the war, he argues that after the war is over with, this will be a century for the common man and woman, not just in America, but around the world. And he felt it was time for national and international politics to match this new idea that the common man cross racial lines, cross, cross class lines, et cetera. And he's making an argument that it was time for America to really use its resources, not for the purposes of imperialism or for uh, conquering the globe, but for the purposes of uplifting millions of people out of poverty, not just here, but abroad too. Now, Wallace's Progressive Party platform was one that welcomed a lot of volunteers and activists to it. It was a platform that was very anti-racist. It was a platform that was opposed to the Cold War. It was a platform for peace abroad and social justice at home. So it's no surprise that, for example, a young Coretta Scott would get involved in the 1948 Progressive Party campaign. Now, I mention this because we often think of Coretta Scott, later Coretta Scott King, primarily as Martin Luther King Jr.'s wife. But as you can see from this photograph in 1948, it's nearly five years before she meets King, Coretta Scott was already thinking deeply and critically about issues of civil and human rights, not just at, in America, but around the globe too. And Coretta Scott's first real political experience was being a volunteer for the Progressive Party in 1948. Now, ultimately, the Democrats would win the election. Uh, Harry Truman would win the election narrowly. Um, but as you can see in the South, some of these states do indeed go for strong third. Uh, including, of course, South Carolina. But despite Truman's victory, uh, he doesn't really make much more headway on civil rights in his second term, uh, mainly because the Cold War becomes a bigger and bigger issue. And meanwhile, Southern Democrats and even many conservative Republicans 
stymie further efforts in Congress to push forward legislation on civil rights and labor rights as well. Now, I want to quickly transition to talking a bit about education, and this is where other Anderson will come in pretty soon. But I want to set the stage for this first by talking about how the NAACP is approaching desegregation. Now, in the 30s and 40s, their legal strategy was very much all about the idea of being, if not okay with separate but equal, at least forcing the South to live up to the equal part of separate but equal. In cases such as Missouri uh, Gaines versus Canada in 1938, for instance, um, you have the NAACP pushing Southern state governments to create graduate schools, law schools for their Black citizens to, again, uphold the equal part of separate In South Carolina, there are attempts to do so as well with USC's law school. Um, last week, I mentioned um, the right in the USC Board of Trustees case in 1946. But before that, in 1938, Charles Bailey tried to desegregate USC's law school and failed to do so. Um, but again, all of this was falling under the umbrella of the NAACP's legal strategy. That would soon take a very different turn. Now, by 1951, the NAACP was continuing its strategy when they decided to come up with the case in Clarendon County, South Carolina case that was initiated primarily by Eliza and Harry Briggs, who were simply seeking some school buses for their children to be able to use in Clarendon County. Uh, with their white counterparts, their kids had buses, and the Briggs simply said, hey, we just want some school buses for our kids to help them get to school safely and on time. And they were denied those school buses. Now, the funny thing about Briggs v. Elliott is that it's a case that begins talking about the school buses and access to quality education, but it ends up being perhaps, well, no, not perhaps, the most important Supreme Court decision of the 20th century. Reverend Joseph Delane, the man you see here, was already an activist involved in the civil rights movement. He provides considerable support to the Briggs family and encourages them and other families in Clarendon County to pursue what becomes known as Briggs v. Elliott. Now, the NAACP does get involved in this case, uh, as does for Justin Simpson. Now, this part of the story is really important. And actually, if you watch the um, Simpkins documentary from about a month ago, it went into more detail with this too. But Simpkins leads major efforts to provide uh, food and other monetary relief for families that are getting involved in the Briggs v. Elliott case, because what's happening is that as these families get involved in the court case, they're being targeted for retaliation uh, by white businessmen, by white property owners in Clarendon County. They're losing their jobs, they're losing very close to losing their livelihood, and Simpkins leads the effort to provide them relief, uh, often against the advice of the national NAACP. I think in the documentary, there's a story of, of Simpkins uh, actually cussing out Roy Wilkins over the issue of getting aid to families in Clarendon County, which the only thing about Roy Wilkins, not that surprising, but I digress. But Simpkins led the effort to raise aid uh, from Black Americans and from Americans all across the country to help folks in Clarendon County. Um, and by the time the NAACP takes up the Briggs v. Elliott case, uh, Thurgood Marshall finds himself being asked by Judge Waiting's Waring in South Carolina, well, why are you just going for holding up separate but equal? Why not try to go for destroying the entire system of segregation instead? And by this point, the NAACP was also beginning to try other court cases across the country, including out of Speaker Kansas. And by 1954, this omnibus of cases becomes known to history as the Brown v. Board of Education decision of 1954. Now, 
And I, I can see Brett looking at me right now because he wants, he wants me to tell this story. So I have to go ahead and do this right now. Well, the Supreme Court, and you, when you have like a collection of cases under one name, typically the name that comes first alphabetically is the, the court case after which the whole group of cases is named. Now, you've got Briggs v. Elliott, then you've got Brown v. Board of Education, right? I comes before O in the alphabet. So the question becomes, why is the case known in history as Brown v. Board? Now, we're pretty sure there's a good reason for this. Our good and dear friend, James Burns, who by 1954 had transitioned from Secretary of State to being governor of South Carolina. After he left the Supreme Court. After he left the Supreme Court, right. And what we were pretty sure about now, what we know pretty well is that Governor Bur well, James Burns does not want the chief case that will break the back of segregation to be a case coming out of South Carolina. So we believe he convinces the Supreme Court to go ahead and name the case Brown v. Board of Education so that this piece of history will belong to Kansas and not to South Carolina. Right now, by the way, there is an effort underway by folks in this state to get the case renamed Briggs v. Uh, because they argue that that would be more historically accurate if we're going by what the Supreme Court traditionally does. Regardless of what the case is known to, historically speaking, whether it's Briggs or Brown v. Board, and by the way, I want to make very clear, I wasn't even aware of Briggs v. Elliott until I moved here in 2000. Well, um, so I think there's still a lot of work to be done on making sure folks are aware of the proper history of Brown v. Board. But despite the fact that the Supreme Court in unanimous decision rules that segregation is unconstitutional, the question becomes, what does this actually mean on the ground throughout the South? The following year, the Supreme Court rules in the ground to decision that Southern states have to enforce this law with quote, with all deliberate speed, end quote. Basically giving the Southern states plenty of time in which to enact desegregation in their school systems. Now, this is 1954-55. To give you some context for this, my mother who grew up in Augusta, Georgia, uh, did not attend a desegregated school until 1970 give you a sense of what deliberate means. And there were a variety of tactics and strategies tried in Southern states. Um, actually, let me back to that for a second. In South Carolina, for example, folks like Marion Brissett, who was a state senator in South Carolina, leads a major effort to make sure that desegregation doesn't get very far in the K-12 school system. Uh, he heads a committee in the state Senate that becomes known simply as the Grissett Committee, which puts up considerable roadblocks to desegregation in the 1950s and 60s. And if memory serves, Senator Grissett represented Orangeburg in the state Senate. Is that right? Or Orangeburg area? Yes. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, now, of course, once the Voting Rights Act goes through in 1965, once the Black vote becomes a key factor in South Carolina, he's gonna to have to change his tune very quickly. That is a story for another time. But the Grissett Committee becomes really important as not just a symbol, but an actual serious impediment to social change in South Carolina. Um, the Palmetto State is also the site of other significant battles <laughs> in the civil rights movement of the 1950s. For example, the young woman you see here, uh, Sarah Mae Fleming, becomes a key, if sometimes forgotten, contributor to the movement um, by resisting segregation on public bus, bus line here in Columbia, South Carolina in 1954. Um, what makes her case so important, by the way, becomes part of the broader v. Gale decision in 1956, the federal court system ruling in her favor, a ruling that segregation was also again unconstitutional, is actually what leads to the end of the Montgomery bus boycott now found. 
that goes from 1955 to 56. But Sarah Mae Fleming's case predates all of that by over a year. Um, and again, if you think about this time period, there are several bus boycotts in the South in the 50s. Uh, we know Montgomery best for a variety of reasons, the presence of Martin Luther King Jr., the fact that uh, Rosa Parks is very easy to make into a symbol, whereas someone like Sarah Mae Fleming, who was a young woman, um, who wasn't quite as adept within the movement, it was a bit different with her. Uh, she didn't get the credit she deserved for a variety of, of social reasons, for social factors, et cetera. Um, but again, there are efforts underway now to make sure that Sarah Mae Fleming is better known, both in South Carolina and throughout the country, for her efforts in the civil rights movement as well. Now, across the South, you also have the creation of white citizens councils, uh, which become known basically as the Ku Klux Klan in business. The white citizens councils couch their language in the rhetoric of states' rights and racial purity. Openly, publicly, they are not saying they believe in violence. They're simply saying the races should know their place and we know what's best for both black and white folks in the South. Now we know that behind closed doors, the citizens councils had no problem whatsoever with violence against black Americans and any civil rights activists. And in fact, in South Carolina, Center of the White Citizens Councils was actually in Orangeburg County, um, which I think also gives some further context to what students at SC State and Claflin were faced with in the Orangeburg group of the 1950s and 60s. But they're really literally in the belly of the beast when it comes to talking about segregation in South Carolina. Okay, so I think I'm going to actually end with this and then turn it over to Dr. Anderson about what's going on with higher education in South Carolina at this time. But by the early 1960s, um, leaders in South Carolina are trying to construct a way to resist desegregation without making the state look as bad as, say, Mississippi. In fact, you could very easily make that one of the themes of the courts of South Carolina politicians saying, how can we make our state as friendly to white supremacy as possible while not looking bad while doing so? Uh, enter, of course, Strom Thurmond, who uh, leads the fight against civil rights in the U.S. Senate in the 50s and 60s. For example, he has the longest filibuster in U.S. Senate history at over 24 hours straight. But then you also have folks like Ernest Fritz Hollings, um, who, as governor of South Carolina in the early 1960s, is governor during an important moment of change in the state, where by the end of his administration, uh, Clemson and the University of South Carolina are both becoming desegregated and Hollings himself, before he leaves office in 63, gives a speech to the state uh, General Assembly where he says, we don't like Brown v. Board, we don't agree with Brown v. Board, but Brown v. Board is the law of the land. And so we're gonna have to make accommodations for that particular law. Does that mean things in the Palmetto State go swimmingly after that? Uh, in the words of some of my students, uh, hell to the no. <laughs> but it does open the door for still more activism here in South Carolina, which we'll talk more about in a moment. But I think now is a good time to turn the floor over to Dr. Christian Anderson, who will put some of this in context in terms of higher education in South Carolina. Now, Dr. Anderson is an expert in the history of education, um, and he has done a lot of fantastic work about education's history at USC and in South Carolina, more broadly speaking. So could we all please give Dr. Christian Anderson a warm, but just a Simpkins School walk. Is Wright and V Board of Trustees at the University of South Carolina, which Dr. Green has already talked about, where John Wright in 1946 applies to, to law school at, at the University of South Carolina, is denied admission because he's Black, and the judge gives three options. Admit him, close the law school, make it available to no one, or open a separate but equal law school. 
Well, we know what happens. They open a law school at, at Orangeburg at South Carolina State, and then um, uh, open this law school. It's short-lived, only 19 years, only 55 graduates, but its impact is huge. Ernest Finney, first black state Supreme Court Chief Justice, graduates, uh, the defender of the Friendship Nine, activist in, in Rock Hill, Matthew Perry, who desegregates Clemson, who desegregates University of South Carolina, who appeared in this photo that, that Dr. Green just showed with Sarah Mae Fleming, um, is one of the graduates, one of the first graduates, and, and several others. Um, but what if the university had said, okay, let's admit John Wright and let's move on with this. Again, what if? And the third one is Chester Travelstead. And how do we, I'll let you move. Um, now, Chester Travelstead is someone that you may not have heard about. He grew up in Kentucky, went in the Navy, came back, lived briefly in Illinois, where he earned a master's in music education at, the, at Northwestern, but otherwise lived his whole life in the South, in Virginia, Kentucky, Georgia, and then South Carolina. And I'm going to use him as a lens into the South Carolina uh, history um, and, and civil education and civil rights history. And as I mentioned before, you're going to see the intersections. I think you'll plainly see the relevance to today. Some of the things that we talk about are very similar to the kinds of things that Dr. Green talked about, where it's like, am I talking about 2024 or 1940? Uh, eight in, in the case that he used. One other point that I that I think this points out that I'll prime us to think about is just the, the cost of racism, how costly it is, both emotionally and spiritually, but just in terms of money as well and, and, and human capital. And then the last thing I want us to think about and this is something that I've thought about a lot. And as I was working on this, I, I just kept coming back to wanting to focus more and more on Travelstead's story, because one of the reasons that he fascinates me is this question of why do we become activists? Why do we become involved in the cause? Why does Brett Bercy do it? Why does Robert Greene do it? Why do you do it? Why are you here? What is it that motivates you to, to push along with this? So. With that in mind, let me just tell you a little bit. Of the, the basic story of Chester Travel said that I learned when I moved to South Carolina in 2007. I, I grew up in Utah, lived in New Hampshire, college in Utah, and then grad school in Pennsylvania. I'd never lived in the South. Visited North Carolina a few times, been to Georgia and Virginia but had very little experience um, in the South came here in 2007 and soon thereafter learned about Chester Travelstead. And the story, the basic story is this, that on August 2nd, 1955, he gives a talk to summer school teachers at the University of South Carolina in Drayton Hall, which is the auditorium on, uh, that's attached to Wardlaw College, part of the Wardlaw College building. And in it, he says, Brown v. Board of Education is the law of the land. It has been declared a year, more than a year ago. It's time to get on with it. And specifically, he says, it is my firm conviction that enforced segregation of the races in our public schools can no longer be justified on any basis and, then sh and should be therefore abolished as soon as practicable. I find nothing which requires, justifies, or even allows a notion of second-class citizenship for any group. Anyone want to venture a guess as to how this was received at the University of South Carolina mm -hmm. in 1955? You're shaking your head. What do you think? Probably not well. Not well. That's the understatement. There were no black students. No. There were no black politicians. 
And Mr. Pat Bloods white. So he's fired. He's fired. He gives this speech on August 2nd. He goes on a planned vacation already that he's already had planned um, with his family. He comes back to find a letter in the mailbox. Whoops. Oh, shoot. Push. Oh, there we go. There we go. He, find, he comes back on August 21st. Uh, from a vacation, and this letter dated August 19th is in his mailbox. The executive committee of the board of trustees is of the opinion that it is not in the best interest of the university to renew your appointment as dean. Um, very um, graciously, I suppose, they say you can finish out the year. They didn't make him leave that very minute. But very clearly, they are trying to silence him, say, and, and and make it clear if you speak up again, probably not going to have this grace period. So my question that I always wondered is, was this a one-time event for Chester Travelstead? Was this something that he did, a stand that he made, but was or was it part of a larger tra trajectory in his life? So a few years ago, it just so happened that. <laughs> The other thing I should mention that I knew is that he left for the University of New Mexico, became Dean of Education at the University of New Mexico. So a few years ago, the History of Education Society Conference was in Albuquerque. And I said, well, I think I better tack on a couple of days and go to the archives and see what I can find out about Chester Travelstead. Because what we have in the archives at the University of South Carolina about Chester Travelstead is all focused on this one incident. And, and it's it shows up in, in the history uh, you know, that was written in 2001 uh, about post-war South Carolina briefly. And, it, you know, and, it, and it's a known story among certain people on campus, but it's not widely known. Um, and I had no idea about the rest of his life. So I look up at the archives, see that they have his papers. I email them, say, so I'm going to be in town on, on these dates. And I look at this stuff, so I tack on an extra day. And I get there, and turns out that they have boxes and boxes of, of his stuff. Mo they have his, all of his speeches. They have lots of letters and memos that he'd written, uh, a box of mis miscellaneous stuff that they had not processed yet. They've been sitting there for years. I'll mention that in a minute. Um, but most importantly, they had these vignettes or kind of memoirs that he had typed on a typewriter called a series of autobiographical vignettes. I was there is what he titled it. He never published it. He never put it into a book form. It's just been sitting there in the archives at the, at the University of New Mexico. And so I dug through them. And I hope you will forgive me for reading quite a bit from his own words, because I think they're more powerful than anything that I could say. Um, so, as I said, my question is, what is it that causes us to get involved in this? Is it something innate? Is it something that we learn? I, I don't know if we'll answer that question fully today, but um, I, I, I wanted to use him as, as an example to help talk about this. So, um, Let me start with this. Oh. Oh, sorry, I, there we go. There we go. Okay. Unfamiliar computer, sorry. Um, some of these vignettes are, you know, very much rooted in, you know, this is what happened while I was an administrator or a faculty member, but some of them he's recalling his early childhood. And he, he admits at the beginning of each one of these, of these sections, Memory is faulty, but I'm doing the best I can. I'm trying to be as honest as I can. And he tells this story about when he was eight years old. He says, my mother took my brother and me to an ice show being held in the armory in Louisville, Kentucky. As we entered the balcony at one end, I noticed that six or eight rows in that area were located behind the high scenery backing seats 
and were already occupied by Negroes, all of whom were trying to peer around the edge of the scenery in an effort to see the skaters who were warming up on the ice. But it was obvious to me that even their stretching, with their stretching, they could not, they could see only a small part of the rink. This worried me. And so he says, I brought it up to my mother. She says, that's the only place they can sit, she answered. But they can see only a small part of the show, I continued. Still watching the skaters as she took off her coat and sat down, my mother shocked me by saying rather matter-of-factly, yes, I guess that's right, Chester, but they're just, and I don't use, I won't use this word, N-word. My mother actually said that. They're just, and he quotes what she said. At age eight, I had no answer for that. But I remember I thought about it several times during the ice show and wondered what it really meant. Then he recounts later in the same vignette, several years later, when my mother found me eating lunch at our kitchen table with Zora, our Negro cook, she told me in front of Zora that I was not allowed to do that again, and I didn't. But I was very unhappy with this restriction, which somehow did not seem right to me because I liked Zora very much and we always had fun talking together. Of course, this is a little boy. He's going to defer to his mother, but he expresses that it confused him. Um, and then he fast forwards to, uh, to a time when he is at, at Northwestern University in Chicago and there are two African-Americans in his music education class. And they get into a discussion about, about race. And he says, this uh, young Negro woman seated near the rear of the room, by habit, I suppose, since there were no segregated seating at Northwestern University, stood up and very courteously asked Dr. Park if she could answer what Mr. Travelstead had just been saying. Because he had, he had been, he says, I unconsciously had been repeating the norms that I'd been taught as a Southerner. And then she laid out that, all she wanted was the same opportunity as, as anyone else. And I, I, I won't read the whole thing. And uh, ended by saying, we want a chance, a fair chance to become all we can be. We don't want handouts for pity. They just want, we just want to be treated as human beings, free to live along whites and other races with equality of opportunity. Um, with that, she sat down next to a Negro man whom I later learned was her husband, also a teacher from Louisiana. He put his arm around her and quietly said, amen. Silence reigned. No one moved or spoke for perhaps half a minute. What she said sobered me considerably. I recalled again and again sitting behind that scenery in Louisville years earlier and my mother reminding me firmly that I was not to eat at the same table with Zora. Certainly, I was no longer what I once was. Dr. Park, the professor, sensing very well where we were in this learning situation, said softly, class dismissed. So that's one uh, example that, that he cites. Um, another one that he talks about is being in Sunday school uh, as a child um, and, and protesting when the teacher, you know, basically says that uh, Catholics will go one way, and we, you know, they, being good Presbyterians, will go another way once they uh, exit this mortal coil. And he protested that. Um, but the one that that fascinates me is when he was in graduate school at the University of Kentucky doing his PhD, and Eleanor Roosevelt is coming to give a talk. And it's part of a series that, um, that, they were, uh, that they were doing at the Coliseum in, in Lexington, Kentucky. And if you <coughs> know anything about University of Kentucky, what reigns supreme there? Basketball. And, uh, it's, even though it's technically no, the Coliseum, it was even in the, its earliest days known as Rupp Arena because uh, of what's Rupp's first name? Adolf. Adolf. 
<laughs> how, could I, how could I forget that? Adolph Rupp was the famous basketball coach who helped create uh, Kentucky basketball into what it was. Uh, if you've ever seen the, the movie Glory Road, he's depicted by John Voight when, uh, the, when UTEP or Texas Western, as it was known at the time, becomes the first school to play five black players to start an NCAA championship game and beats Rupp's uh, all white uh, Kentucky Wildcats. Um, so at the time, Chester was in graduate school, but he was also the head of a community organization, the president of a community organization that was organizing these, uh, these talks, excuse me. And he receives a, a letter that says, this is to advise you that Mrs. Roosevelt will not speak to a segregated audience. This is 1950 in Lexington, Kentucky. And he says, such a statement would be viewed as ridiculous in the year 1982 when he's writing this. But in 1950 in, and in Lexington, Kentucky, it was a very serious matter, even shocking to many of the good people of that small, small and quiet city in the heart of, of the bluegrass where whites and Negroes lived and worked together peacefully just so long as the Negroes kept their place. I'm quoting here. Um, and as he mentioned, the Coliseum had already been popularly dubbed as Rupp's Cathedral. And so he says, as president of the Community Concert Association, I was obliged, obligated to convey to the association's board of directors the message that we just received from Mrs. Roosevelt's agent and to call a special meeting to consider what our response to that message would be. And so he goes into detail about how he negotiates this with the board and then holds a secret ballot. And he is supported by Frank McVeigh, the president of, of University of Kentucky. And they prevailed by a vote of 16 to two to not have a segregated audience, not just for Mrs. Roosevelt's visit, but for all of the concerts for that whole year. Um, that's a rather meaningful and significant uh, victory in Lexington, Kentucky in 1950. He goes on to say, nor was there a single embarrassing or even unpleasant incident connected with it. The main credit for all this, of course, goes to Eleanor Roosevelt, great woman of principle, but recognition should also be given to Frank McVeigh, who helped lead a frightened group to take a noble step that year in Lexington. Um, so that brings us to his time in South Carolina. Uh, amazingly, uh, times were different. Today, you could not become a dean after you know, three years after finishing your PhD. Uh, and, uh, but he somehow leapfrogged from assistant professor to, uh, to Dean. He was teaching at the University of Georgia when Donald Russell uh, called him. He had come to campus to interview to become Dean of the, of the School of Education at the University of South Carolina. And uh, Donald Russell called him on a spring day in 1953 to tell him that he had been selected as, uh, as Dean of Education, but he helpfully informed him that he was the second choice. It's usually not something that you tell people, <laughs> but, he, but he told him. Um, so uh, Donald Russell tells him uh, the College of Education needs uh, major renovations, not in the building, the building was still fairly new, but in terms of its curriculum, it had no PhD. So it was the only uh, major university in the South uh, without a PhD in education. So it, it, it needed a lot, of, uh, a lot of work. So he had his work cut out for him. Um, he recalls that when he came uh, for his campus visit, he had uh, coffee and, and dessert at the president's house. And he asked President Russell very point, pointedly uh, about the application 
of African Americans to the university and what would happen and would they be admitted? In answer to my question, President Russell said that even though the state of South Carolina was not at that time faced with the applications from Negroes, denial of their right to enter the university could no longer exist. He stated further in our conversation that he fully expected Negroes to be admitted to the University of South Carolina, quote, within the next three or four years, a prediction I was pleased to hear him make. In this discussion with Donald Russell, I found him to be highly intelligent, well-educated, articulate, affable, and reasonable. We were not in complete agreement about everything, um, including about teacher education, but nothing he said made me feel I would not like to work with and for him. He also made observations about how well off Donald Russell was. And he said uh, that the president's house was full of expensive things, quote, that must be their personal possessions since it was unlikely that the University of South Carolina and the poor state supporting it were affluent enough to furnish the president's home so lavishly. Um, he even talks about how Mrs. Russell had had strawberries flown in, and this is in February, flown in uh, from California because she wanted to have a proper dessert and not some winter dessert. Um, so he starts as dean uh, of, of, of education in the summer of 1953. Um, and he talks about how life in South Carolina was moving along quietly on a segregated basis. Talks about how his uh, only experiences out of the South that I, as I mentioned, were his uh, short time at Northwestern and his time in the Navy. Um, and then he goes on to comment after having been at the University of South Carolina for a period of time, quote, my, this is him, I'll read from him. My earlier assumptions about the private wealth of President and Mrs. Russell were confirmed soon after I arrived. I learned that earlier in his career, Donald Russell had been a law partner of James Francis Burns, better known as Jimmy Burns in Spartanburg, and had benefited financially when Mr. Burns went to Washington in 1931 for what, for what turned out to be an extended and yet not altogether distinguished ser service with the federal government under President Roosevelt and Presidents Roosevelt and Truman. Um, in three different positions held by Burns. Uh, uh, Donald Russell served as his chief assistant, a valuable relationship with, which paid material dividends to Russell for several years after they both left Washington in 1947. Not only did Mr. Russell benefit from the huge income, which continued to flow into that law firm bearing the famous Jimmy Burns name, but he also made a great deal of money I was told in a lucrative short-term high interest rate loan business he organized and owned in the late 1940s and 1950s. Now, how many, how many of you have been on the campus of the University of South Carolina? We have a building name for James Burns, the Burns Building, and we have a building name for Donald Russell, uh, the Russell House, the Russell House, known as, which is the Union Building. So a lot of times we hear people get up in arms about the fact that we have buildings on the horseshoe named for former enslavers, rightly so, but there are other characters <laughs> that we should pay attention to with their names. Um, he talks about various appointments that he had with Russell, and, he's, and here I'll read from him again. He says, I also observed that many of his calls made and received during our appointment times were politically oriented some of them with Governor Burns until 1955, others with Governor George Bell Timmerman, you know, who became governor after uh, Burns, and with politicians in Washington. Um, what's Russell running for now was a question often asked among faculty members. Answers to that came later. Uh, of course, after he served as president of the University of South Carolina, he became governor of the state. Soon after I began work at the University of South Carolina, I, I had another private conversation with President Russell about segregation in the public schools and institutions of higher education. I told him I was becoming increasingly concerned about this matter and that at the time, 
And at the time, he reiterated a point that he had made when I was first interviewed. On both occasions, he flatly said, without equivocation, that Negroes would indeed be coming soon to the University of South Carolina as students, a development which he said would be just and as it should be. But then he added in a fatherly tone that I should not let others know how he felt about this matter since it was such a hot potato at the time. I began to have mixed feelings about Donald Russell. <laughs> <laughs> I felt that he was inherently neither a racist or, nor a bigot, but at the same time, I gradually developed the feeling that I could not trust him when it became clear that he was saying different things to different people about his position on the same issue. Always an astute politician, but never a statesman. I think that's a very, well, that's a telling statement. Always an astute politician, but never a statesman. He seemed to always, always to be sure to say only what a particular person or group wanted to hear, whether it was the governor, a legislator, a prominent Negro, his university trustees, a faculty member, or me. So, um, I'll tell about one faculty meeting and then we'll get to a speech and then wrap it up so we can have uh, some time for discussion. So in May of 1954, about two weeks before the Brown v. Board uh, decision is, is laid down, there was a general faculty meeting. And at this meeting, faculty were debating whether to in introduce entrance examinations for, for prospective freshman uh, enrollees. As part of the discussion, one faculty member asked the president, uh, let's face it, and this is a quote, let's face it, Mr. President, is it not true that these entrance examinations are in reality being introduced as a means to, of keeping the Negro out? Without hesitation, President Russell said, no, certainly not. As far as I'm concerned, he went on to say, if a qualified Negro applies for admission to this institution and passes these proposed entrance examinations, he can and will be admitted. Many of us seated at the faculty meeting on that day, including the one who posed the question, felt relieved to hear the president say what he did about this matter. We were even further encouraged in this respect when about two or three days later, we received recorded minutes of that meeting, which included this specific quote from the president. But imagine our consternation, dismay, and complete disappointment when less than a week later, all faculty members and administrative officers of the university received a written directive from President Russell to the effect that we were to return to his office all copies of the minutes of this particular meeting. <laughs> no reason was given for the directive. It just made clear that all, and he underlines all copies, without exception, were to be returned via messenger sent out by the president. Now, of course, certain individualistic, non-conforming members of, the, of that university community just <laughs> couldn't seem to find their copies <laughs> and therefore could not follow the directive. So that's just a couple of weeks before the Brown decision comes out. And then he reflects on what happened when it did come out on May Monday, May 17, 1954. He said, this was referred to by many in the South and in South Carolina in particular as, quote, Black Monday. The re reaction to this decision was a sort of shock, one might say, but certainly a strange type of shock. Instead of inciting belligerence and threats, the decision was followed by calm and silence. Perhaps numbness or even paralysis would be more descriptive terms. No extra editions of the state's newspapers appeared. I don't know if any of us remember that when you'd have you know, special editions of a newspaper that would come out. No speeches or pronouncements were made by Southern leaders in the press or over the radio. The event was so serious that, almost, that most people did not even discuss it, except in private. Apparently, they just wanted to think about it for a while. So life went on as usual. Um, and then he goes on to say, to illustrate how ridiculous actions became, I might add that the South Carolina, and remember I said relevance to today, get ready. <laughs> the South Carolina legislature passed a bill 
outlawing, in essence, a book called The Swimming Hole. The bill demanded that this book be removed from the shelves of the state's public libraries because in it, merely a, ficti a fictional story for children, a Negro boy was playing with some white boys, said to them on a hot summer afternoon, let's go swimming, fellows, in the cool creek. Well, the boys did go swimming as the story developed, and South Carolina legislators maintained that in any story portraying a Negro as the leader of white boys, you see, he persuaded them to go swimming after all, was vile and evil literature. So they passed the law against it. So, fast forward to a year later, May 2nd, 1954, 55, Chester Travelstead decides to write two letters. The Brown decision was issued May 17th, 1954. Here it is almost a year later, May 2nd, 1955. And he's a keen observer of the news. He sees that nothing has happened. They are not taking any action. So he writes one letter to, the, to Earl Warren, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And lamenting this, he said, you know, he says, I believe you made the right decision. Um, he gives his background saying that I'm a, a Southerner with, with two sons who are attending uh, the schools of Columbia, South Carolina, ages 11 and 12. He says, I believe firmly that such, such changes should not be made overnight, but I am definitely of the opinion that some reasonable deadline should be set and met. Well, two weeks after he sends that letter, the second Brown decision comes out urging all deliberate speed be taken in implementing the Brown decision. Now he says, I never received a, a response and surely others were writing the Supreme Court as well and filing their briefs. And I'm sure it wasn't just Chester Travelstead saying, you know, uh, set a deadline and have it met that caused them to, to put that out there. But it's telling that he felt inspired to write to the Chief Justice. Second letter he writes is closer to home, to George Bell Timmerman, the governor of the state of South Carolina. And he sets up his letter by saying, let me begin by saying that I am not a foreigner. I am not an enemy of the state. What is, what is he invoking here? What is he? What is he trying to kind of preemptively? The, from the Red Scare. You know. Okay, Red Scare. He's not. He's not a communist. I'm not a foreigner. But even closer to home, what is he not? He's not a carpetbagger. <laughs> he's not a Yankee. I'm not a Yankee. I'm not a carpetbagger. I'm not from, you know, up north. I'm from the south. Um. I am white and I am a Southerner by ancestry, birth, schooling, and residence. Always lived in the South, Kentucky, Virginia, Georgia, and South Carolina. Except for the years that I spent in the Navy and briefly at Northwestern. With this in mind, I must sincerely and respectfully say that I disagree emphatically with several not it's not, it's not about uh, matters referring to your Never recent mind. and in others delivered oh, during yeah. the current year. <laughs> and the speech that he's referring to is one Two. that that Timmerman gave. of his speech, um, uh, you know, refuting them. Um, and, uh, and at one point, um, the he says, he quotes the governor, he says, you have said, never before has anyone seriously propo proposed that the children of two biologically different races be compelled to mix socially. I suppose you are referring to the Negro and ca Caucasian races. 
If so, it should be pointed out that science has not concluded. Then he goes on to say, basically, that race is socially constructed and and talks about how when I was in the Navy, they didn't label blood for injured soldiers as black and white, just by blood type, because it doesn't matter. Um, and here's one of those points where I wish Travelstead knew the USC reconstruction history because he could have invoked the 1868 constitution that allowed for education of all regardless without regard to, to race or uh, um, ethnicity uh, in terms of who could attend schools and the fact that the University of South Carolina was desegregated. But that history was firmly suppressed even up until recently, so certainly in the 1950s. And it doesn't surprise me at all that he did not know that, that history. Um, he says, education takes place in many ways. Our children can be educated um, to deceit and chicanery, as well as they can be educated to integrity and loyalty. This education is not confined to the schools or home. These chil children learn from everything they see and hear. Well, he must have felt pretty secure having sent this letter because that was in May. And then uh, in July of 1955, he received a $600 pay raise, a significant amount in 1955. And a renewal of his contract, so he felt surely everything's fine. Now, at some point during the spring of, of uh, 1955, the School of Education had planned a, a lecture series. No, it says that I'm I, it's, it's resolved. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. No, we don't need to. All right. Oh. There we go. So I know you can't really see this that well, but the point is that there was a brochure explaining that there was a series of distinguished speakers, not just from the University of South Carolina, but from around the country, Florida State, other Southern uh, institutions of, of higher education, Columbia University, um, Emory University, New York University. Um, and then one of the distinguished speakers was Chester Travelstead, speaking on his home turf. And so, he um, he delivers his lecture on August 2nd, 1955, ca called Today's Decisions for Tomorrow's Schools. And he says, here and now in the summer of 1955, we find ourselves faced with the necessity of making many momentous decisions with respect to the schools in this country. Perhaps no other, that no other time in the history of education has so great a sense of gravity and urgency characterized the action concerning the schools which is being taken and which must be taken in the near future. Decisions made by men throughout history have become milestones in the records of the past. And then he goes on to say that he quotes Cervantes, the 16th century Spanish novelist, said that a weakness of man is saying that by the streets of by and by one arrives at the house of never. South Carolina's own John C. Calhoun described a period in the early history of the state in which decisions and actions were held in abeyance. Mr. Calhoun wrote, quote, in the meantime, our policy is masterly inactivity. So he's quoting John C. Calhoun from more than 100 years earlier, but what he's referring to is the South Carolina way of saying, well, if we don't deal with it, it'll just stay status quo the way we want it to be. And we won't have to deal with this, various issues that he outlines here, but especially desegregation. So he outlines okay. eight issues, and I won't read you his text about each of them, I'll just name them off uh, about the, and again, relevance to the, today maybe, teacher shortages, shortage of classroom space, low levels of teacher salaries, teacher certification and education, um, and uh, the nature of the curriculum and financial support of the schools. 
And then the last issue, integration of the races within our schools. And then this is where he gets to the meaty part of, of his talk. He says, the problem of integrating the races in our public schools is unprecedented for those who were born and raised in the Southern states. It is a crucial problem in South Carolina today. Uh, I must say that I, I have been surprised and disappointed that the education profession Let me try to pull up. I got it. Yes, okay. Um, so, oh, sorry. Um, so he, he, he goes on to talk about how the, the state has been avoiding in, you know, again, he's referring back to the Calhoun quote, and he says, um, talks about the, the resulting inaction by the 1955 South Carolina legislature concerning segregation in the schools. I must add that I do not consider the Gresset Committee, who Dr. Green talked about, representative of the education profession in South Carolina. It is a legislative committee appointed to advise the governor and legislature on a particular issue. Um, and then he goes on. To the key part. It is my firm conviction that enforced segregation of the races in our public schools can no longer be justified on any basis and should therefore be abolished as soon as practical. Um, besides my own personal beliefs in this matter, there is the legal side of the question of segregation. If we choose to maneuver and manipulate in order to circumvent these duly constituted agencies of law, how will we explain justify this action to our children and to our children's children. Can we on Monday tell them to obey the law and have respect for the agencies of law and order, and then on Tuesday tell them that they don't need to obey the law, that it is right to circumvent it all along? Um, and then he goes on to, to outline various alternatives and ways to go about this, but arguing that we need to, to get on with it. So as I mentioned before, he is fired, and this makes national news. It shows up in the New York Times. It shows up in Time Magazine. Um, and uh, here's the letter from Marion Gresset, uh, from Marion Gresset to the governor, where they are discussing um, uh, Travelstead's speech. Um, by the way, another thing named for one of these fellows is the Gresset Room in Harper College at, at the university. The Honors College has quietly just sort of stopped calling it that, by the way. <laughs> um, and then, of course, a few days after that, we have the, the letter essentially firing. Um, there are reactions from, uh, from the alumni, both pro and con, asking for you know, I, I no longer want to be a member of an alumni association that would fire someone like him. But on the other hand, plenty of people who say, uh, isn't this a great thing that they that they got rid of this rabble rouser. The Gamecock comes down on the side of Travelstead, but lots of those writing letters in are not. Um, and then, as I mentioned, he goes on to the University of New Mexico, becomes, I'm always interested in what happens to people who get fired and then go on, you know, what do they do with the rest of their career? He goes on to become dean uh, the, at the University of New Mexico, then vice president and provost, and then provost emeritus, and then he dies in 2007 at age 92 or three, I think. Um, I know this is very hard to read, but this was a letter he received in 1960, warning him about the dangers of, high, of, of electing a Catholic president. And it came with these two brochures um, about the autocracy of the, you know, the, the, the papacy would hold over the United States if, if a Catholic were elected and, you know, the, the dangers of, of Catholicism. And so he responded with this letter um, where he says, I, I don't pretend that I'm going to persuade you otherwise, but I want my views to be known and to be clear. And he says, if I took another view, I would lay myself open to the possibility of uttering such bigoted statements as a Jew should not be elected to the presidency or a Negro should not be elected to the presidency 
or even a Presbyterian should not be elected to the presidency. I have no illusions about persuading you on this. I'm merely telling you how and why I feel the way I do. So this was part of that question. Was this uh, uh, a larger trajectory or a one-time thing? Clearly, it was a lifelong process for him. Um, the College of Education building is named for him. And at the University of South Carolina, we have the Travelstead Room in the Museum of Education named for him and the Travelstead Award for Courage in Education. The first such award went to Matthew Perry, who we've talked about, second one to um, Cleveland Sellers, and another one to uh, Millicent Brown. Um, so some folks that you have surely heard of. And then of course, less than a decade after he's made his speech, the University of Desegregates, and just last week, they memorialized this with the statue. Unfortunately, at that event, Matthew Perry, here being sworn in as a, as a federal judge, was not mentioned for his role. Um, the students were mentioned. Of course, they played a significant and key role, no doubt about it. But Matthew Perry should have also been remembered um, for his role. All right. I think I've gone too long. But let's uh, uh, have some time for discussion. Um, well, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask your questions. Okay, Nicole, your hand is raised. Go ahead, please, man. And Nicole, unmute yourself. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I have two questions. Um, the first one, well, the first one's longer. I'll go with that one. Um, can I get more detail on that book ban you talked about earlier with the, you know, it's a book that, you know, that rebel rousing black child convincing mm -hmm. them to do things. So, um, I did this research several years ago and it's all been sitting in a drawer. And then as we were preparing for this, I pulled it all out again and started reading reading through it. And I had forgotten about that story. So I have a long to-do list of things to do. One of them is to find that book. And number two is to find the bill banning that book. Because I, I have the same question that you do, like what, what was this all about? So I will return and report. Well, Thank I you. I would that. love that because I would love to use that to fight our current book bans. Um, question number two is, in the spirit of naming things, is the Gresset building on the State House grounds named for Marion Gresset? Yes, it is the yeah. Jane Gresset Senate building. Senate building. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I figure. Thank you. <laughs> and it's and it's right next to. Uh, the Wade Hampton building. So, you know, <laughs> in good company or in company. Good, good yeah. company. Any other questions, please? Yes, go ahead, please. Are all of his vignettes available online? No. I have a stack about this big of ones that I scanned and then printed. Uh, no, they never published them. Um, they're not digitized. Um, but I am this, I this is why I'm really grateful to Breton and Robert for inviting me to do this because it caused me to reread this stuff. And I am now finally going to write up this story. Cause I, I mean, it shows up here and there in little bits, but I, I think it's the kind of story that, that needs to be more widely known. Anyone else? Any other questions? We didn't talk about um, Jimmy Burns's uh, very expensive effort to um, equalize separate behavior. And um, I know that scores about hundreds of millions of dollars were spent and they built the, Dr. Green, do you have a map that you put up in an earlier class? You don't need to look for it now, but we can refer people back to that uh, education equity is what we refer to. And there's a website that Low Country History Digital Archive had in your study group or in your study guide that uh, lays out this effort to go around the state and build schools. I was in Beaufort High School, it was segregated, and they built Robert Small School um, for the black students. And that the, um, the effort to do that, Jimmy Burns did with 
the zeal of anti-communism because he had determined that that was a very strong domestic, politically a strong position for him to take. And that he came out of World War II being a big anti-communist and was able to figure out the black people weren't smart enough to go their own freedom, that somebody had to be, there was a communist came down and told them they was being taken advantage of. And Burns, um, uh, that didn't last that long in terms of the, the, uh, the effort for equity. Obviously, it was in 1970, the last school bus was turned over in South Carolina, Lamar, protesting busing. And uh, we still have a great disparity in terms of education funding and equity because it's predicated on your local taxes picking up the difference. So if you live in a poor, poor zip code or a poor county, you're not going to get as good an education. The Education uh, Finance Act of 19, whatever, um, Dick Riley was president, president. Dick Riley was governor when that passed. Yeah. And it was theoretically supposed to equalize the amount of money. And it, it did kind of equalize the amount of money the state puts in. But every year since it passed, they, they pass a rider on the budget saying, oh, we don't have the money this year. And so it's very rare that they actually fund it equitably, but it's only maybe 2,800. Uh, and then there's federal money that comes in and then there's local money. So if you're in a rich neighborhood, your school is better. So that yeah, the, of, the extra money doesn't matter as much because you've already got a rich tax base. Yeah. For, and the communism was used, I, I glossed over it because I was running long, but a lot of the letters uh, deriding Travelstead were calling him a communist. This communist, I mean, it was an easy, easy, you know, 1955. It's, it's an easy it's term a, to use. club to beat people with. You can't imagine I've actually been called a communist myself. Yes. <laughs> really? That's surprising. Well, and, and, and in his writings, he does not explicitly talk against uh, loyalty bands, but very clearly is against this idea of, um, of blinding loyalty. That, and that NAA, he went after the NAA, anybody who was in the NAACP couldn't take the pledge to support separate but equal. If you didn't support separate but equal pledge, you're out. And so they just fired scores of teachers that were members of the NAACP. It became kind of a, a backwards loyalty test. If you were a member, you had to say you were a member and get fired. And there's a considerable amount of work on that and the study guide on that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, Question of fashion comment. I know you mentioned when um, you talked about the lynching and okay. South Carolina not wanting to like kind of show that it was associated with lynching. Right. Um, and then you also mentioned how uh, education saying that we can't teach people that follow the law one day and then not follow the law or, or actually not follow the law ourselves. But I'm noticing like even to today where we had the concept of um, laws being created, but they don't really apply to you know. Us and so, uh, was there or was there a transition between people like flaunting, doing criminal behavior, uh, or was there always this thread of, you know, we say we're law and order or we're say we're this way, but it really only applies to people. And well, so I'll start with lynching as a, a symbol of this. So if you go back to say the eighteen eighties and eighteen nineties, you do have. Many Southern politicians who criticize the general issue of lynching, they're saying we're not always in favor of lynch mobs, but then you'll have many of them like Ben Tillman, for example, will say, but, you know, specific examples, we got to do what we got to do. What you're seeing, however, by the 1930s and 40s and 50s is that, especially after World War II, more and more Southern politicians are criticizing lynching. They're saying this is a relic of the past. We have to stop. We have to put a stop to it. But then you turn around and they are certainly comfortable with a uh, law and order being used as a cudgel against, say, the civil rights movement, or they're favoring things such as um, massive resistance, where they're trying to find different strategies and tactics to resist desegregating schools. And, and for example, in Virginia, an entire county shuts down their public school system for five years rather than enforce Brown v. Board. Uh, in South Carolina and other southern states, you have the building of segregation academies to kind of get around Brown v. Board and so forth. And so I think what your question really opens up here is the idea of, well, what is law and order? 
right? What does it mean to actually, number one, follow the law? And number two, what does it mean if even the federal government in the aftermath of Brown v. Board isn't really taking serious steps to enforce its own federal law? Um, so again, these are the kinds of things that they're coming into. They may see some of the law. Southern politicians were saying, we don't want to break the law this way through the lynch mob. But we're still okay with breaking the law this way through massive resistance, the siphoning off of tax dollars, so on and so forth. So again, the KKK and businesses with the right white citizens councils. It's the same idea of law and order for me, but not for thee. And today you look at the, the crackdown on protesters at various universities, they're saying, well, you need to, it's law and order, you need to obey the law. Well, peaceful. Peaceful assembly is the law. It's literally in the First Amendment. That is the law, to peacefully assemble and to speak. And they're saying, well, but not our way. Right. That's not the way we want it. And, and also to that to that point, Brother Anderson here, just this weekend, we're seeing uh, many campuses across the country where the police and other authorities are being called in, while at the same weekend, we're seeing white supremacist group hold, groups hold marches where the police aren't even present. They're just simply saying, oh, this is just freedom of speech. But on a college campus, it's apparently a threat to public safety. Yeah, and, and I, I know that you've got your hand up. Uh, one more point on this is that uh, while I was uh, at University of New Mexico digging into all this stuff, I met, actually, I met them online uh, via a friend who introduced us. Uh, he said, oh, you'd be interested in this person who lives in Albuquerque, maybe have dinner with them. And then it turns out that her husband knew Chester Travelstead really well. And so she's like, oh, you don't want to talk to me. You want to talk to my husband. So we all went to dinner and mostly it was uh, me and her husband talking about Travelstead. And he had been a graduate student at University of New Mexico in the late 60s, early 70s. And he told me this story of how Travelstead as provost had diffused basically a bomb of uh, when these students wanted to incite a riot and he said they want the police to be there and they're going to incite them to draw their and fire their weapons because they they want this and he and this graduate student worked with Travelstead to convince them to keep the police out because if there's no firecrackers there's nothing to set off and so it was a big dud nothing happened and everyone went home and and he told me how I, don't, I wish I could remember the details more clearly than that, but he said, you know, he, he basically diffused this situation. Go ahead. Me? Yes. yes. Never mind. I, what I had to say wasn't actually relevant to what was being discussed. So it's, it's, all, all, good. it's all relevant. <laughs> don't worry. It's all good. We're fine. You can move on. Dr. Green, I want to make sure everybody knows that South Carolina is not through slow walking <laughs> the right thing. Um, there was a federal ruling that um, said that you, that you have to provide bathrooms that people relate their gender to uh, yesterday. And yesterday, the superintendent of education here in South Carolina, that Ella Weaver woman that I told you is from the dark side, she issued a statement that says South Carolina students are not pawns to be sacrificed in cynical political games. And said that the school districts can disregard federal regulations. Excuse me? The war's not over yet, dude. No. Nope. Uh, not that USC's administrators today would ever talk out of both sides of their mouths around social justice issues, but what uh what lessons for those, you know, for those of us in the uh, belly of the beast, what lessons are there from travel set in terms of how to how to handle these issues of moral conscience? I think number one is pay attention, pay close attention. I think too many times it's easy to be beguiled by someone in power who tells you what you want to hear. And you're like, hey, I said the right things. Everything's great. Pay attention. Is he saying the right things to you? Is he, or is he saying something else to someone else? Um, the the other thing that that I gather from Travel Step is is kind of his calm demeanor and analysis. He 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 was not quick to temper, and he thought things through, and was very principled and unwavering. Um, 
Russell, uh, I didn't go into the details, but Russell basically said, well, you can keep your job if you'll just walk this back. And he said, no, I'm not walking it back. I said what I said, it's on the record and it's what I meant. And when he went to, to the University of New Mexico, Tom Pope, Joy, the president, said, well, the reason for your firing at the University of South Carolina is a badge of endorsement for us. That's what we want. We want you here. Even though University of New Mexico obviously isn't exactly the same as University of South Carolina, but he, he wanted that kind of attitude. All right, folks, so we are right at about time for tonight. Let's give Brother Anderson another round of applause. Um, and, uh, you know, next week, we're going to come back here once again and get a bit deeper into how the human rights movement of the 1940s and 50s transitions to the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, and what these differences mean for folks like Justice Simpkins, uh, for the movement in South Carolina, the movement across the country. So again, We've got a lot to talk about in terms of how activism changes over time. And we have the Authors of Justice Deferred this Sunday. Uh, what time? Four. No, that's at 6.30 because um, Dr. Burton couldn't do the four. So th this is the, the second and only time that your deep dive on Sunday isn't at four to be able to accommodate Dr. Burton, who is um, in much demand. And he uh, and uh, Armand Durfner in Charleston, who is one of the probably last living greatest civil, civil rights attorneys that desegregated a lot of schools and made a lot of changes in redistricting law, wrote a book about the race, the, the fact that the Supreme Court rulings between the late 1930s and the 1970s were mostly giving citizenship rights to corporations as opposed to people. Using the same constitutional, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, we know were the ones that were where our rights were embedded, and those rights have been eh, given away. And one last thing uh, start thinking about uh, any sort of activism projects you want to get involved in with the Progressive Network now. Uh, of course, we have Missing Voter Project, uh, we have other projects as well. We're going to talk more about those in the weeks to come because, again, the purpose of the Majeska Simpkins School of Human Rights is not just to discuss and talk about this rich history of the Palmetto State. It's also to think about how to apply the lessons of the past to the problems of the present. If you watch the news, there are a lot of problems for us to deal with right now. So on that note, have a have a great <laughs> Monday night, and I'll see you all Monday and Monday. Thank you.